In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. This event was held in Mitchell. <laughs> okay, I'm Tom Gaffert, and I'm uh, from Kimball, South Dakota, and I uh, farm with my son Andy, and we raise corn and beans and wheat and milo and oats. And uh, we run about 320 commercial cows, and then we run about 140 yearlings on grass. We've only been doing this uh, cover crop deal two years. Um, but we've had a few hiccups with it, but I think the biggest hiccup was when I let Marissa talk me into doing what I'm doing right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the first year when I went out uh, and we did it, it was really dry, and I didn't even know the drill would go on the ground. But we planted it, and uh, it rained a couple days after that, and I had a beautiful stand. But it didn't grow. It wasn't growing quite like I wanted to that year. And uh, then the, about the 1st of September, we got a light frost. And we had planted like, oh, I should be doing my PowerPoint. We'd been planted like um, turnips and radishes and winter peas and sedan grass. And that frost, this, it just tipped the sedan grass right over. And the winter peas and turnips, they continued to grow, but not at at a very good pace. And um, then that year, we uh, also we went out, we split a field. And uh, we had half of it, it was all in wheat stubble. We had half of it, uh, we planted half the field, and half of it we didn't. And uh, we grazed it all off, we, uh, it, that was okay. But we were not growing very tall, we really didn't get that much grazing out of it that year. But uh, it was no difference. We planted it to that split field. We planted it to corn the next year, and uh, there was no difference in yield. I mean, I couldn't. It wasn't like the cover crops used up a bunch of moisture or anything like that. And uh, so then anyway, we after that year, I, I wasn't really that happy. But we thought we'd try it again, and we came around this year, and we, we had I had a field that was uh, wheat and oats side by side, and I thought, well, that'll be a good test. So we we planted it, and uh, the wheat just came up beautiful. I mean, it just came up beautiful stand. And the oats, I kept waiting for it to come up, and it never came up. But the year before, we had that into Milo, and I used Halex as a pre, and we put on a little atrazine. And I don't know if that was it, or we had sprayed that oats a week with Roundup a week before we planted it. But uh, I, I don't know. We, we still don't really know what the problem was there. Uh, but I had a good oats crop, so as far as the Halex and stuff, I, you know, I had a really, you know, it was a good stand there. And then when the, when the cover crops didn't come up, I went in there and I planted winter wheat and I got a good winter wheat crop. So I don't know what happened to that oats. But anyway, the, well, that was that split field. Anyway, uh, this year we planted crimson clover, turnips, purple, oh yeah, radishes, um, winter peas, sunflowers, and millet. And uh, like I said, um, this is where, oh, there on the, the one right there, that's, well, oops, oops. Well, I don't know where I'm at, but it, anyway, anyway. Anyway, um, like I said, it, it didn't come up in that oats ground, and, uh, but the winter wheat did. It, it really it came up beautiful, and um, we, uh, Turned the cows in there, oh, I suppose about the 1st of December. We got eight inches of snow. And they went in there, and I mean, they ate, and they ate, and they ate. I mean, they just, they really, uh, they got what they could out of it. Uh, the one thing, I, I didn't know it until I was sitting at a sale barn talking to, uh, talking to a farmer of mine that planted them also. And when we had them on those turnips and stuff, I, the cows weren't going, they had a well to go to and they weren't going to water and I couldn't imagine where those cows were drinking water. But he told me, he said, they, they don't go to water, they don't need water. And I'm not telling anybody out here to go plant a field of cover crops and you don't need any water. <laughs> but they just don't drink water. I mean, uh, no, it, it really worked out well. Um, then, uh, well, let's see here, yeah. That was, yeah, that was this year, year, and, and then, uh, anyway, I don't know if any of you do pheasant hunting, but I have a, we do a little bit, but I have a, far, or a friend of mine that guides a lot, 
and he brings hunters over and he hunted. I had a pheasant plot by this turnips and he was just amazed with the pheasants and the, the turnips. Uh, the one thing he really liked later in the year he rele started releasing birds and uh, the birds stayed there. I mean they didn't leave. I mean he, he was in fact he was just over the other day he was going to plant turnips on his ground. He just he was totally amazed at it. And then the last thing, uh, one day I picked some of those turnips and radishes and took them home and I had them sitting there and my wife asked me what they were and I told her and that night I came in for supper and I said, what am I eating? <laughs> and she said, those are turnips. And oh, I mean, they were good. We ate a lot of turnips last fall. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, that was it. But no, that's, that's about the way it is. Um, the one thing you're going to be, if you get involved with uh, the, the cover crops, you're going to have a full partner, and that's Mother Nature. I mean, she's got to work with you, or you probably won't get a lot done. Uh, but, uh, and we have had no, we've only been at two years, but we've had no real compaction problems with the cattle running on there. Uh, I don't know, I think the ground freezes and loosens up and stuff, uh, but we haven't, we haven't noticed anything there. But that's about all I got, so. All right, thank you, Tom. Yep. I'll let Jason get the mic switched over here. I do want to ask a couple of questions. I've been curious about this because I've been sitting here. Who in the audience is currently nosy? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. That's a great amount. Who in the audience is currently maybe cover crops on that operation? <laughs> okay, who has livestock on that operation? Who has all three of those things going? So you're no-tilling, you do cover crops, and you've got livestock. So that seems, if you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be the pattern I keep hearing from these speakers is those are kind of the three magic things if you want to bring this all together is that, you know, integrating the no-till with the cover crops with the manure and the livestock. So just an observation, but there you go. Yeah, I'm, can you hear me up there? Yep, I got both of them. This is the one that. that is this one. one. You need to hold this one too, though. Why? Why? For the video. I don't have the video. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm Dick Nissen. I'm from seven miles north of the Dakota Dome in Vermilion, and uh, kind of the bottom end of the Vermilion River. And uh, I'm on the bottom end of a 3,600-acre or 2,600 acre watershed. So I've seen a lot of stuff that's bothered me a lot and a lot of erosion, a lot of silt going down to the Gulf of Mexico. And I think it was 1995, I studied no-tilling from a lot of reading and stuff and I started in no-tilling in 95, corn and beans, wasn't getting very far, so then I put winter wheat into my rotation, which was a tremendous move. I wouldn't wouldn't even think about trying no tilling if you didn't have at least a three-way rotation. 2002, we started doing uh, cover crops, and I don't know. I think I planted about every cover crop they can think of, but radishes, turnips, and uh, I like annual ryegrass, has done a lot of good in my soil because we're wet and we need, uh, we need a lot of root structure and everything, live roots in the ground to get into the, get into plant in the spring. Oh goodness, I don't know. Uh, my son's working into the operation now so hopefully he'll be the sixth generation on this. So. We'll try and keep it in the family and and uh, make it more productive all the time. Uh, we tiled just about all our top ground is tiled, but I got uh, retention dams on every outlet, so we aren't draining pollutants into the river. And uh, I don't know. That's probably about it. I did make one mistake though. This year we planted soybeans instead of corn into the wheat stubble. 
and that 50 acres made 111 bushel of the acre. So there's a lot of benefits to cover crop and wheat. So if, if you can't make money off of wheat, just have a little patience and, and uh, you'll get your money back. Thank you. Well, there are some people that have uh, uh, told me that I have a good radio face. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. First of all, I'm going to stand so that I can see some of the things that I have here and and uh, point at those, if I might. Uh, I think uh, the, the gentleman on the left is my grandson, and I think that's really what it's all about. Uh, uh, you know, we need to uh, watch what we're doing, and we need to do that for our children, our grandchildren, and our uh, great-grandchildren. And this is part of the, uh, some of the pictures that were taken uh, this summer, and you might note some of those corn, whoops, I'm doing the wrong thing here. Uh, some of the corn ruts there that you can see down here, and, and uh, uh, that's from a corn that was just taken out with a spade, so you can see how far down they're going into that uh, no-till ground. Um, just a couple of comments. I'm not uh, originally from uh, South Dakota, a uh, Minnesota farmer to begin with, and I uh, moved to South Dakota. I was one of nine kids in the family. Now, that doesn't tell you a thing about what I'm going to say here today, but it does tell you I didn't know what it was like to sleep alone until after I got married. <laughs> and when I, when I talk about my grandson, he's the one that's interested in farming uh, down the road. And so I need to have about another 15 years uh, of course, I consider myself middle-aged, and then my wife asked me uh, how many people I know that are 146, so. <laughs> but anyway, just a summary of my practices. I've been no-tilling corn and soybeans, and I say a rotation here. Dwayne says it's not a rotation, it's a monoculture. I think it would be a biculture probably, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, we do try to work in some cover crops, and I've been working with Peter Sexton on that. We've been using uh, uh, cereal rye as a cover crop after corn. And as Peter indicated, if it doesn't come up in the fall, it usually comes up in the spring. And uh, so far, we have not, uh, we've been doing this, I think, for six or seven years. We have not seen any differences in crop yields. We're looking at soybean yields following the, uh, the corn. And, and maybe we should be looking a little bit more at the corn yields. And we have not uh, looked at that. Uh, soil organic matter has increased about 2% since I've been no-tilling. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we use pretty much just uh, conventional uh, planting equipment. The soil fertility has greatly improved over the years, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, we're using a 2x2 two two, uh, uh, starter placement for the uh, P, the K, the sulfur, the zinc, and about half of the nitrogen. So we're putting on about 400 to 450 pounds per acre of dry fertilizer. And then the, the uh, remainder of the nitrogen is applied with the weed spray after planting. And so I'm fertilizing both the corn and the soybeans at the same time, so to speak, because I do not, I have not been putting any fertilizer on the soybeans. Uh, this gives you some idea of uh, what we plant into here. Important, of course, that the crop residue be uh, properly dist distributed and so on. Those are corn stalks from two years ago and then the soybean stalks and we'll be planting uh, corn into that. But if you move that residue away and look at the wormholes, this is what you see. And uh, that's really quite amazing, uh, the effect that that will, that will have. This is the planter system that we use. Uh, we're pulling a Montag uh, cart behind the uh, planter. And of course, it takes a little bit of engineering to accomplish that. Uh, not many people to help you out with respect to how that's set up. 
otherwise, the planner is pretty much a, a, a standard uh, John Deere planner. We use the, the uh, cruiser wheels on the back for the closing wheels. And uh, we're using row cleaners there. And then you can see the fertilizer set up there. I think this shows a little bit better idea. And uh, nobody makes a dry fertilizer boot for a John Deere planter. So we adapted our own. We found this on the, on the internet. And uh, we use a liquid uh, fertilizer opener, uh, modify it for a dry attachment. And uh, of course, it takes a lot of hydraulic oil to uh, do all those functions, five circuits, and a and, uh, pretty good supply of hydraulic oil to blow that. <clears throat> this is what the uh, hose setup looks like. And we modified the, uh, the platform here, just raised it, and, and uh, passed the hoses through there to the, to the front of the planter. Now, <clears throat> um, this past summer, and Dr. Ward could probably expand on this if you'd want to later on, but, but uh, I wanted to do some studies with respect to what's happening with the soil, and I wanted to look at uh, soil health. And so I sent some samples to his uh, lab, and basically these are the results that we came up with. Whoops, again pushing the wrong button. Uh, the fence line samples are supposed to represent probably what was originally there because to my knowledge that fence line has never been plowed. And so you can see the pH at 7.1, the organic matter at 5.3, uh, the phosphorus at, uh, at 28, and that uh, is a malic uh, phosphorus, the potassium at 4.29, and, and so on. And then I took some field samples. And uh, here the pH was 6.9. And by the way, I used some pH from my other soil samples. I think we hit some of the fertilizer bands when we did that. And the pH was quite a bit reduced. But I had some uh, uh, regular soil samples taken from the same year. And the same was true with the phosphorus because I used uh, uh, where this is a malic phosphorus, this is a bray phosphorus. And so there should be some adjustment there, but at least uh, it gives us some idea what's happening. But the important thing that I want to point out is this organic matter. Uh, in 100 years of tilling, basically we destroyed about half or probably more of the organic matter that we had in the soil. Uh, if it started out at 5.3, I've been farming this ground since 1976, and I've had some soil tests as low as 0.7% organic matter. And most of them in the early 70s were 2.4, 2.5 in that range. And with the no-tilling, we've brought that up now to 4.9. But I also wanted to look at uh, microbial activity in the soil and, and soil health. And so this is the uh, fence line sample again. And uh, if we look at the biological activity here, PLFA, phospholipid fatty acid, and that gives us a measure of the microbial activity in the soil. And the fence line was 7,400 roughly, and the diversity index about 1.7. And if you look at the table that Ward Lab sent out, and I thought he might talk a little bit more about this, you can see that uh, on the excellent soil there, it's above 4,000. Uh, this sample was taken in July, about a week after a rain. So it gives you some idea, because we really have to have something to compare with. And I wish I'd have taken some samples of uh, uh, soils that weren't no-tilled at the time, so I might make that same comparison. But uh, if we look at the biological activity in the fence line, uh, I would say that's really good. If we compare that to uh, my no-till soil, uh, we had uh, a uh, uh, total living biomass there, uh, 5,163 nanograms per gram. And you can again see that's off of their charts with respect to an excellent soil. We don't have quite the same biodiversity here with a 1.4. That just ends up uh, to be in the good range. Uh, but I think part of that might be that we had uh, 
um, less fungal activity because some of that sample, I think, was taken again at the very high phosphorus levels in the row, and that probably depressed fungal activity. So that's uh, what I wanted to show uh, there. Uh, the change in soil organic matter, and I just put on the chart here since 1974. I got two main farms that I've had for this time that it, with no-till, and you get some changes from year to year in organic matter. It doesn't always uh, show up with a steady increase, but that gives you some idea what's happened to organic matter in my soils over the years. And uh, this is a picture that Anthony Bly took, uh, my no-till soils on the right there, soils from across the road on the left. And uh, one other comment that I want to make, not much was said about that today. When I first started no-tilling, I felt that the benefits in reducing erosion was primarily coming from the residue cover. And I really find out that that's not the case. It's coming primarily from water infiltration, at least in my opinion anyway, because we did the water infiltration tests and uh, with some of the studies uh, in my no-till field for two inches of rain to soak in, took 17 seconds this summer. In my garden, my garden had been no-till for about 15 years. I plowed it this last spring, and it shows you how quickly you can destroy the no-till operation you by eliminating the worm holes, eliminating the root holes, uh, that sort of thing. And there, depending on when I took it, it took from six to 45 minutes for that two inches of water to soak in. And that's the reason why the water soaks in rather quickly, all the worm holes there. That's it. All right. Great job. Al, the last promise your name was Harry. He's going to have a lot more Harry. Harry. <laughs> 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 okay. <clears throat> Al was talking about water infiltration. And last, oh boy, it was like the first of June. We had, well, in one week, we had three three-inch rains. And my neighbors across the road do conventional tillage. I mean, it's black when they plant their ground. <clears throat> in my field, I, well, after the first inch of rain, you could see theirs look like a lake. And after three inches of rain, I still didn't have any water on my field. So, I mean, that's really important. That's that's water in your ground that if you tilled the ground, it's gone. And it's probably going to the Gulf of Mexico and we'll pollute the Gulf of Mexico and Uncle Sam will come along and tell us how to farm. <laughs> Uh, we went into standing stocks with the drill. Um, sometimes that was planted, uh, oh, even about the end of the first week in November. Uh, most years we get a few days where you might few, see a few sprigs coming up, but not uh, too much. Uh, one of the problems that I saw with that, and we did not do that this last fall, I want to use a little bit different approach, but uh, going with the drill with seven and a half inch spacing, we cut up the corn stalks and we had more residue blow. And I felt that I was losing residue with respect to uh, that type of practice. So want to try something else down the road. If you don't chop the stalks and cut the stalks, do you have any problem getting the seed in the ground? No, not really. Uh, of course, it's important that you look at, uh, you know, planting depth and the adjustment of the drill because uh, I think too many people don't watch that. Uh, when uh, we use the uh, local conservation services drill, they say, well, we normally set it this way. And I said, no, I set it this way. I mean, you got to take into consideration the residue, make sure that you get the uh, 
the planning depth correct. Pardon? No, with the row. Well, I, I try to plant as close to the row as I can. Uh, go, well, watch your speed. And then, well, like Al said, make sure you adjust for your trash on top to go get it in the ground. And then I got uh, Martin row cleaners in the front, so they, they'll knock it down. But you can be two inches either side of the row and uh, still have the same results as going right on top. The reason I go on top is because you got your old roots there, and then that's your mellowest part of the field, and, and then uh, plants seem to grow better there. Yeah, the, as far as the <coughs> planting, I'm like him. We, we plant about two inches from the row and we're planting following the row, but when we go in with a drill, we plant at an angle. We just seem to get a better stand at an angle with a drill. But a couple, three years ago, we bought a vertical tillage machine, and I don't know, I guess we wanted to use it. So we went out to some of our corn stalks, and it was a beautiful seed bed when we got done. But like he mentioned, blowing, or if you get kind of a heavy rain, I mean, it, it can be a disaster. It, it, they'll, the rain will wash it around, and you'll have piles of stalks, and yeah, it, yeah. Uh, we drill ours with a no-till drill, 15-inch spacing, so it's a... John Deere soybean special, and uh, so we have two rows between each uh, corn row. We go with the row. Uh, that way the, uh, the tractor's uh, not running over the stocks, and we save a little bit on tractor tires, uh, uh, that sort of thing. I don't have any problem with residue unless uh, it's a spot where maybe the combine stopped. Uh, residue management, of course, is real critical. And uh, it's not so much the stalks it is, as it is the husks that are difficult to, to, uh, to cut. Uh, we don't use any row cleaners on the, on the drill. We use row cleaners on the planter, but uh, no row cleaners on the, on the drill. Uh, we've never had a problem. Tend to plant probably at too high a population because you think you're uh, going to reduce emergence and so on. And, and uh, we've never seen a, a real problem with any reduced population. Okay, more questions? All right, I have one for you. You guys, now that you've been down this road a little bit, you can go back to the very beginning when you started down your no-till journey. What would you do differently? I would have started with the three ray way rotation right away and then come back with the cover crop on the wheat stubble. That seemed like that was the best move I made. Uh, we've tried uh, rye in the standing corn, but we don't, we don't get enough sunlight down there. I don't know, our, our rye doesn't come very good. So, but, uh, oh, we just been, we flow ours on, so I guess that's, that's not really the way to go either. I see they got these new drills out for a fraction of a cost. I suppose you could go and drill rye and a four foot tall corn or whatever, but I don't know. You want to? Yeah. No, I don't know if it, how, probably not very many of you grow Milo, but the one thing we found out when we went no-till, Milo likes warm soil. I mean, you just got to wait a little bit longer. Don't get in a hurry planting that, but other than that, uh, no, we, we didn't have any problems. Well, things that I'd do different, we made plenty of mistakes. Uh, I started out small and so made them on a small scale. Uh, things like not enough down pressure, uh, sidewall compaction. Uh, none of those things uh, probably really, really serious, but uh, uh, you learn to watch those things as as uh, times go, time goes by, and you become uh, more astute at what you need to do. Uh, No-till is not a simple system. It takes more management rather than less. 
the other comment that I make that I forget to, when we talked about the residue, you, you, you know, um, uh, with 200 bushel corn, um, I feel that I don't have enough residue. It doesn't last the entire summer. There's plenty to plant into and so on, but uh, uh, it's pretty well decomposed by about July. Any more questions? I rolled them one year. I will never do it again. And I, I just thought it might help with the uh, with the combining. And uh, I don't. I'm not really getting rot water runoff from my no-till ground, but the neighbor's uh, ground has runoff, and it comes down through mine and brings all the corn stalks with it. We had a heavy wind after that, and most of them ended up with my yard in my yard. So I had to rake those out. So. Uh, no, I uh, I won't uh, do any rolling. Apparently, you must not have <laughs> uh, Fortunately, we do, we do not. No. Well, <laughs> I got to be careful there what I say because uh, ours was just a trial, and you got to make sure that you that you. Um, that you obey the rules with respect to crop insurance. But uh, I basically did what Anthony was talking about. Uh, if we had really wet conditions, I would wait until uh, after the beans were planted, and I would uh, uh, kill it off at that time with my first spray of Roundup. If we had dry conditions, I would uh, usually try to get it killed before I plant. And uh, too often it's happened where we had dry conditions when I was about to plant and killed it off, and then we got really good rains and, uh, you know, wouldn't have had to kill it. But uh, so we didn't have a whole lot of growth some years. But.